ವಕ್ರತುಂಡ ಮಹಾಕಾಯ ಸೂರ್ಯಕೋಟಿ ಸಮಪ್ರಭ ನಿರ್ವಿಘ್ನ ಕುರು ಮೇ ದೇವ ಸರ್ವಕಾರ್ಯು ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ನಮಸ್ತುಭ್ಯ ವರದಿ ಕಾಮಿ ವಿದ್ಯಾರಂಭಂ ಕರಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ಸಿದ್ಧೇರ್ಭವತು ಮೇ ಸದಾ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನಕಲ್ಯಾಣ ನಿರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮವಿದ್ವರ ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಮಸ್ಕೃತ ನರಂ ಚೋತ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವ್ಯಾಸ ತೋ ಜಲ ಮುಧೀರ all right so we are seeing this wonderful story mahabharata now before we get into the rest of the story first i want to let everyone know where we are let myself also know where we are and make it very clear because there's going to be a lot of different parvas we see today okay so let's just have a look at this so we can refresh our memory okay here we go now here we started from adi parva so if you remember mahabharata has 18 parvas or 18 different chapters and within those chapters there's sub chapters also so we started with adi parva the very beginning this is a the long one you know the whole time where the pandavas and kauravas were growing up their birth etc sabha parva sabha means the hall so this is where the game of dice took place vana parva is in the forest so where they were in exile and how they spent time in the forest arjuna acquired his pashupatastra bhima met hanuman ji and so forth virata parva is when they were in the kingdom of virat so they took on several disguises and they stayed there Udyoga Parva is when they tried to make peace. There was an effort to make peace. And this is when Bhagavan Krishna goes as a messenger and he shows his Vishwarupa Darshan to the court. Then peace didn't, that effort didn't quite work out in the sense that Duryodhana refused after so many people telling him. So war had to happen. and the first commander was bhishma so therefore bhishma parva and bhishma on the 10th day he fell because uh, they put shikhandi in front and arjuna shot his arrows behind shikhandi then came drona he assumed the next commandership so that's why it's called drona parva because drona then now becomes commander but drona also dies because drishtadyumna finally defeats him he actually drona breaks down because of that ashwatthama hata that lie and then finally uh, he is defeated 
by Drishtadyumna. Then Karna takes over. So it is Karna Parva. And Karna goes into war and, you know, very strong, very ripe, very majestic. But he has two curses on him that his wheel will sink and he will forget his astras, how to invoke his astras. Therefore, he is also finally defeated. Then Shalya took over. So you see the Kauravas, they kept on having different commanders. The Pandavas only had Drishtadyumna. Shalya took over, but Shalya was finally defeated by Yudhishthira. Hmm? Then Ashwatthama, uh, then what we see in this Shalya Parva also, we saw the Gadayuda between Duryodhana and Bhima. And how finally Bhima was he defeated Duryodhana for good. He hit his thighs with a mace. And on that concept, we talked about, yes, it, it is seen as adharma in the, say, in the sense of gadayudha. But when somebody is sinking so extremely low in adharma, dharma doesn't bring them back almost. It's like, you, what, what else can you do to defeat this person? You have to go to such an extent because you have to bring up dharma in the long run. So even though it seems like very wrong, please know that the vision is always to bring back dharma in the long run. This remains the constant vision in Bhagavan Krishna's mind. So although we might think that you know, so why uh, did he block the sun from Jaras for in that Jarasandha incident? Why did he tell Arjuna to shoot Karna when the wheel was sinking? Why did he tell Arjuna to, you know, point to Bhima and point to the thighs so that Bhima would hit Duryodhana at the thighs? All of this is because he wants Dharma to run in the long run. He wants Dharma to be up held. Hmm? So that remains the constant vision at all times. Next was Soptika Parva and this was very sad where we saw last time where Ashwatthama he went and you know he defeated all he killed all of the Upa Pandavas, Shikandi, Drishtatyuna when they were sleeping and they set fire to the Pandava camp. So this much is where we are. This much more we have to cover. They are small parvas. So we will see how, how much more we have to do. Okay. So just so everybody's clear in their mind where we are. So as I mentioned, this question can come. You know why Lord Krishna would do such things? It's because the other people have gone through such extremes of adharma such extremes that they cannot be controlled, they cannot be stopped. And the only way to stop them is to do that, which is seeming a dharma, but it's actually in the long run, upholding dharma. Now, the example that uh, I gave last week to somebody who asked, it's like when, you know, an undercover cop has to go and join, uh, you know, some gang, pretend he's part of the gang or she's part of the gang to, to catch them, you know? So he, he or she has to go undercover. They do have to lie. They do have to pretend that they're, you know, part of the gang, etc. But it is because they have to catch those people and uphold dharma in the long run. So some examples like that are there if we think about our lives. Now there is one thing I left out in Shalya Parva, which is really important. The, when the war finished, war finished, you know, everybody stopped fighting, etc. Shalya fell down. War finished. What happened is Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, Arjuna, get down from the chariot. And Arjuna is, you know, thinking, okay, you know, why is he telling me to do this? And 
and he's attached to his chariot also because his chariot was a gift he had these amazing horses he had this gandiva these never ending quivers so um he gets down arjuna gets down and fine now what happens lord krishna gets down from the chariot and when lord krishna gets down from the chariot immediately that hanuman ji in the flag flies away and the whole thing is burnt up and arjuna is just shocked and says how how is this chariot how is everything burnt up my horses my chariot it's divine and lord krishna says oh arjuna you were hit by the astras of drona of karna do you think you could have withstood all of this it was only because i was sitting in your chariot that you were able to withstand it otherwise it would have been long gone and everything burnt up this incident is so beautiful because so many times when we succeed in life when we do good deeds when we rise we think it's us doing it we think it's us doing all of these things but really it is only because we're able to tune in to divinity and it is tune in to god and it is god's will that's working through us it just so happened at that point all we did was tune in that much effort we did that much effort we just tuned in and then god bhagavan krishna began all his work and therefore it's a great reminder again that we are but instruments of god at any time we think we are the doer laugh at ourselves our chariots our bodies we would have been broken long ago if it weren't for the fire of the divine working through us so this is that uh, dramatic moment in shalya parva for arjuna then in soptika parva we saw that very very disturbing kind of thing happened to the upapandavas you know in the midnight midnights when they were sleeping they were killed there's a deeper symbolism to this in life we have two kinds of vrittis or thoughts one is what we call the negative thoughts one is what we call the positive thoughts and in the beginning of our spiritual journey we have to eradicate the negative thoughts and stay away from negative thinking hence the eradication of all of the pandavas but as we get deeper into the spiritual path even those subtle positive thoughts or vasanas have to be detached from they have to be transcended even our subtle positive thoughts because that can create ego and pride so the upapandavas rishtadyumna shikhandi all of those who are left they represent our subtle vasanas that also have to be transcended and the fact that they were sleeping means it's a very subtle thing it's a very subtle thing to do and therefore they were also killed means one also has to transcend that then what happens the five pandavas represent our prarabdha karma so after we have transcended the negative vasanas and thoughts through positive vasanas after we have even detached from the positive vasanas then that saint is enlightened but they still have to move on they still have to wait till their body falls and that is their prarabdha karma symbolized by the pandavas that are left over so this is the symbolism of the saptika parva and how 
you know, Ashwatthama, after all of that, he threw his Brahma Shirsha Astra. We saw that last week and Arjuna countered it. And it was so incredibly strong that Narad Rishi and Vyasa Rishi had to interrupt. Otherwise, it would destroy the whole world. And Arjuna, they asked Arjuna to recall his Astra. And because of his Tapasya, he could do it. But Ashwatthama couldn't do it. And so they said, you take back that curse that may the world be Pandavales. And he redirected it to whichever Pandavas in the womb will be killed. And at that point also, they asked Ashwatthama to surrender his gem, which gave him all kinds of immunity and strength. And that gem was put on Yudhishthira's crown. And Lord Krishna told Ashwatthama, I promise you, I will give life to that child whom you directed that astra to. And that was Uttara, the wife of Abhimanyu. And he said, Ashwatthama, you will roam about this earth in complete gloom. And thus ends the Soptika Parva. Now we are moving on to the Stri Parva. Now the Stri Parva is a very sad one. Huh? It's a very sad one because all the women are mourning. Actually, see what happens is after the war, uh, Bhagavan Krishna goes to Dhritarashtra. He goes to Dhritarashtra and Gandhari and he consoles them. He consoles them right after the war because he says, you know, I know that you have such a great, great loss, but please know that this was bound to happen because Duryodhana made those decisions and Adharma cannot prevail. It cannot, cannot prevail no matter what we do. And so he consoled Dhritarashtra, he consoled Gandhari. They were both so sad and depressed. And, you know, he went back to the Pandavas. And now what happens is there's a bunch of dead bodies in the field. So you can understand how many there must be. There's an abundance of them. And so they all have to cremate the bodies. They have to perform the rites of the bodies. And so... Dhritarashtra has to go to the field and Gandhari has to go to the field. And so in this three parva, all the wives, all the daughters, all the mothers of all of these warriors who fought in battle, they're all there. And they're all just in tears and just hurting and in so much pain. And it's here where we see Draupadi in pain, Kunti's in pain, Gandhari's in pain. And in fact, you know, um, that Gandhari, she could see through her spiritual sight, through her spiritual, you know, she had like a, she was able to see through her spiritual intuition what was happening. She was able to see all of these bodies and she was just heartbroken. And in this uh, Sri Parva, she laments one after the other, one after the other. She laments and she lets everything out. So everyone is in such, such gloom with all of these dead bodies that are there. Everyone is in tears and sorrow. And, you know, the Pandavas, they thought that they won the war. But after the Upa Pandavas were killed, means the sons of Draupadi, they were also heartbroken. They were not in the mood. Nobody was in the mood to do anything. And they could not imagine a deeper sorrow than this. Finally, what had to happen was, of course, now Yudhishthira, the Pandavas had to meet Dhritarashtra and Gandhari. And so Sri Krishna, Bhagavan Krishna, purposefully met Dhritarashtra and Gandhari beforehand. Because he wanted to console them because he knew Gandhari's tapasya. He knew Gandhari's tapasya and she could, because she, her tapas was so deep, she could curse. So she, he made sure he met them. And so now the Pandavas had to meet Dhritarashtra and Gandhari. So first they met Dhritarashtra and Yudhishthira goes and 
touches his feet and he just apologizes for the war and he, you know he says i'm just really sorry that this all had to happen and all destruction had to come and the drashtra understood because krishna had explained to him everything he understood then it was bhima's turn to meet dhritarashtra now krishna told bhima wait bhima said why and so bhagwan krishna went to duryodhana's room quickly there was a metal statue of bhima which duryodhana was practicing on for years and years together he was practicing on this metal statue and lord krishna brought this metal statue in front of dhritarashtra it so happened that you know when dhritarashtra heard that bhima was in front of him immediately he thought of duryodhana's death about him uh, you know being hit in the thigh and he thought of the death of all of his sons because it was bhima who caused it and he hugged that bhima he didn't know it was a statue he hugged it he hugged it hugged it hugged it and he was able to crush it to pieces he crushed it to pieces and he fainted he said oh no i killed bhima and lord krishna brought him back up and said don't worry that was not bhima that was the metal version of bhima i knew you had such anger such anger so i have put this in front of you now you please go and embrace bhima and so he embraced bhima and this way he embraced arjuna and he met all of the pandavas so all of them were slightly relieved because you know dhritarashtra whatever it was this was their uncle you know this was the one who he was like supposed to be like a father to them and so their hearts were a little bit like oh, okay we met because imagine i killed all of your sons and now i have to go meet you that is a very very weird feeling how do you meet if if somebody has done so much distress to someone's family how do you meet the person it becomes very very difficult ha huh? i remember when this happened when we were in yuvakendra one of our chicks our yuvakendra he passed away he passed away when he was riding behind someone in the bike and so the one that was driving the bike had to go meet this boy who passed away his parents that was very hard that was just very very difficult you know so things so this is what was happening in their minds now they had to meet gandhari they were very scared they have everybody was scared of gandhari because she has been practicing severe tapas so everyone was scared of gandhari so the first person she asked for she said where is that bhima no where is that bhima she was so mad at that bhima and she said bhima how could you hit duryodhana in the thighs how could you do this and bhima said you know i took a vow i took a vow and gandhari devi you know he says mother when if if i had hit duryodhana's thighs in that assembly when draupadi was insulted you wouldn't have said anything but i couldn't do anything i had to hold myself back because of yudhishthira and therefore because he showed his thighs to draupadi i took a vow that i would hit his thighs i would crush his thighs and i cannot back down from my vow and so gandhari was and 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 you know she was a little bit appeased and bhima said look at everything that duryodhana has done to us he tried to poison us poison me he tried to burn us in the house of lack he tried to he tricked us so many times he tricked us into this game of dice we tried to make peace he didn't even want peace how he insulted draupadi so she was a little bit appeased and she said but what about dushasana that was just cruel how did you drink his blood and bhima said trust me i had to put it in my mouth because i vowed it but it didn't pass by it didn't pass beyond my tongue and my teeth my lips and my teeth it didn't pass beyond that so he didn't swallow anything 
She said, I had to do that because of my vow. So Gandhari was a little bit appeased by Bhima and Bhima apologized. Gandhari was a little bit appeased and Yudhishthira came. So then she said, where is that king? And Yudhishthira comes and, you know, so now he touches her feet, takes blessings. While he's touching her feet, you know, her uh, blindfold is a little bit open. So she saw his nails. Immediately his nails turned blue. And Arjuna saw that and Arjuna hid behind Bhagavan Krishna and said, I don't want to go to Gandhari. <laughs> and, you know, because everybody was scared of her. Then finally, uh, Yudhishthira finished, Arjuna came and Gandhari was finally, she was a little bit peaceful. Then what happens is, she, after meeting the Pandavas, so the Pandavas are relieved because they met, they met Dhrasha, they met Gandhari. She's still so heartbroken. She's still so heartbroken. And she yells at Bhagavan Krishna. She says, Bhagavan Krishna, this is all you. It's all your fault. It's all because of your indifference to the Pandavas and the Kauravas that all of this happened. You are the one to blame for this destruction. And she said, with my tapasya, I curse you. I curse you that your entire Vishni clan will destroy itself and it will get destroyed 36 years from now. And the way all of the women are weeping in this battlefield, all the women will weep in the Vishni clan. Ah, and Lord Krishna looks at her and says, thank you for your curse because I was also trying to figure out how the Vrishnis would get destroyed because nobody can destroy them. Only they can destroy themselves. So thank you. And I, anyway, as part of the Vrishnis, I had to figure out how to go, how to depart from this world. And you just told me how to do it. So I am very grateful. But he said, as far as this war, it is you and Dhritarashtra to blame. You stood there indifferent, in silence. You did not say anything. You only said something in the last point. But throughout, you saw these injustices, but you kept quiet. And so Gandhari kept quiet. She had nothing else to say. But now Lord Krishna was cursed. Then all of them, where continued to do all the final rites. And they looked at all the bodies there. Kunti Devi's eyes went to Karna's body. There was no one to perform his last rites because, you know, his father was not there. His sons had died in battle. And she just looked at Bhagavan Krishna. And she said, now she has to open her mouth. Now she has to say it. And she went to Yudhishthira. And she said, Yudhishthira, please perform last rites to him. To him. And she points to the body. Yudhishthira says, why? You know, I mean, his, his brothers are, his son's brothers are not there, etc. But he's a Sutta Putra. He was a Zakaravas, you know. He just had a very questioning look. Why? And Kunti Devi looks at him and says, Yudhishthira, this Karna, he's not a Sutta Putra. He's a Kshatriya. And they all stopped. Everybody just stopped and looked at her. How do you know he's a, he's a Kshatriya? She said he was born of a Kshatriya family. And when he was very young, he was abandoned in his birth. Who could do such a thing? They were all thinking, who could do such a thing? With very, her head bowed, she says, I did such a thing. I am the mother of Karna. He is your brother, the eldest Pandava. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, Yudhishthira fell. His heart just sank. The Pandavas were in gloom. Arjuna said, what? I just killed my brother? He was just, they couldn't believe it. 
And Yudhishthira was always puzzled in that day of the tournament, originally back then when, uh, you know, Karna came in with Arjuna and they were battling and he saw Karna's feet and it reminded him of Kunti Devi and he could never make the connection. And he every time he saw Karna's feet, it reminded him of Kunti Devi, but he, now he understood. And all of them were just in such pain. And Kunti Devi started telling them the story of Karna, of how he was born, how he was raised, and that he knew he was a Pandava, but he did not go into their side and he did not want, uh, you know, to, to say anything because Yudhishthira would have maybe run away and how he took a vow that she, Kunti Devi would always have five Pandavas. So then they understood why they were never killed by Karna. Nakula, Sahadeva, Bhima, they understood why they were never killed by Karna in battle, even Yudhishthira. And... Yudhishthira said, this is the toughest sorrow I'm facing right now. Imagine one after the other. You lose so much of your army. You lose your sons. You lose your, you know, your brother-in-law. You lose your father-in-law. You lose everybody. Now you, he lost his brother. This was the most painful and Yudhishthira was in total gloom and the Pandavas were in total gloom and he just didn't know what to do. And so this was that Stri Parva where all of these revelations came out, the, all of the lamenting of all the people, all of the tears, the sadness, the sorrow of the war was in Stri Parva. Stri Parva means the Parva of the women because Mainly it was Kunti Devi lamenting, it was Gandhari lamenting, even Draupadi. Now all of them had lost their sons. Now we move on to Shanti Parva, the Shanti, peace Parva, because now they're trying to make peace with whatever happened. They couldn't make peace during the war but they're trying to make peace with whatever happened and then try to find ways. And so they spend one month, you know, uh, they spend one month just grieving, okay, grieving and letting go of that grief. You know, even in our culture, we have some 12 days prayer, sometimes 13 days prayer. We have that extended time of prayer. And sometimes people say, why it's so long? You know, because it just gives time to that uh, person to slowly, slowly understand what has really happened. And also in that time, we're meant to do spiritual practices. We're meant to read the Gita, certain verses of the Gita. Some people read Garuda Purana. We're meant to, you know, practice a lot of tapasya and just kind of cleanse ourselves from that whole incident and people are meant to be together as a family and it is actually a, a great healing process when it is done together as a family and that time after someone's death is to be spent in satsanga and so they spent a whole month by that river ganga in satsanga with saints and sages to slowly rise them up to make them back, uh, get back, get alert, get awakened. And that's what they did for that whole month of grieving. So there is also a beauty in how our culture is, how our culture is laid out. Everything is there for a purpose. And if we follow it, then we will only benefit. And so grieving, and in, in that grief, they should have felt like he didn't want to live anymore. He felt like he was the cause of the whole war. You know, he felt like it was him who was the cause of Bhishma's death. Because he himself went to the death, asked Bhishma how he should die. He felt he was the one who sent Abhimanyu to the Chakra Vyuha. He felt like it was 
only him who caused every single thing. He felt that it was him who told Arjuna, now you have to defeat Karna. So he felt like he was to blame for every single thing that happened. And again, this emotional thing was going on in Yudhishthira's heart. And so he was with Narad Rishi. And Narad Rishi said, listen, Yudhishthira, this is what you had to do as a Kshatriya. You're a king and you had to fulfill your duty. You cannot go and wallow in that grief. And besides Yudhishthira, now you are a king. And what happens with a king? A king cannot have personal grief. Anybody who's a king, who's a leader of a society, of a country, of a company, they cannot have personal grief because they're meant to be there for the welfare of the people. So they cannot afford to wallow, to do all of that because they're there for the people. They exist for the sake of the people. They cannot be bogged down. And so Narad Rishi says, you're a king, Yudhishthira. You cannot have any personal grief. You cannot. I think it was this Lokmanya Tilak. You know, when he heard that there was a death in his family, he said, I have no personal tears to shed. All my tears are for my motherland. She kept, can't afford to do it. And Narad Rishi tells him, listen, Yudhishthira, if you want to, learn the duties of a king, I think you should go to Bhishma because he's still in the bed of arrows. But Yudhishthira just felt so guilty even appearing in front of Bhishma that he just, he, he, he just kept it at the back of his mind. So after that grieving period was over and the bodies were cremated, the proper rites were done and everyone felt cleansed inside, then what happened was they went to Hastinapur. Now they went in all that they had to do their duty. So they went with all chariots and horses and elephants. And Yudhishthira was the main one there. And it was a whole procession for Yudhishthira to enter Hastinapura and be king. And so finally, Yudhishthira entered Hastinapura and he was placed at the throne and he was crowned king. And beside him, he had all of his brothers. He had Draupadi. And he assigned, you know, he ruled the kingdom. So he, Vidura was his minister. Sanjay was in charge of finance. Arjuna was the commander of his army. And we had uh, Nakula it was maintenance. Sahadeva was personal protector of the king. Everybody like that had their duties. Yuyutsu was also there. He was in charge of certain provinces. And Yudhishthira went there and he always respected Dhritarashtra and Gandhari. And this is one very beautiful thing about Yudhishthira. He told Dhritarashtra, I am here, but I, I, for me, you are still king. So we will function as per what you say. And, you know, we will work under your guidance. We will serve under your guidance. Now, imagine how much Dhritarashtra has done towards these Pandavas. What injustices were caused by Dhritarashtra? It is his staying silent that this whole thing happened. And still Yudhishthira still treats him as a father, still treats Gandhari as a mother because they are all living together in Hastinapur. And he, and he lives in such a way, or tries to live in such a way that they don't remember the grief of their sons. And he tells everybody in his kingdom, nobody should speak a word against Duryodhana or Dhritarashtra. Now imagine the power of forgiveness he has and the power of dharma to do that. For us, if somebody says something negative, somebody does something bad to us, whatever, we don't forget. Please see towards Yudhishthira, it was a list of injustices. 
in not, not only one year, so over 14 years, 15 years in list of injustices. But yet he does his duty as a king and he doesn't waver from it. That is something extremely powerful. And because he sets that example, Draupadi, Arjuna, Nakula, Sadeva, they don't say anything. Bhima on the occasion, <laughs> he has a temper, so he says something every now and then. But the rest follow his lead. And they don't say anything. And they function against Dhritarashtra's or function towards Dhritarashtra's guidance. And Dhritarashtra and Gandhari also feel peace a little bit. Imagine now you're live you've caused so much pain to someone and they're serving you. That's very painful. You know. If you're fighting with somebody and they fight with you, that's still okay. But if you're fighting with somebody and they do such good things towards you, that's very painful in the heart, isn't it? So imagine Dhritarashtra and Gandhari, they were won by, you know, the Pandavas won their hearts, won their respect. And they were so grateful to be treated with that kind of respect. So this is how the kingdom of uh, Hastinapur functioned under the rule of Yudhishthira. Now, in one incident, Yudhishthira went to see Bhagavan Krishna. And Bhagavan Krishna was sitting quietly, sitting quietly in meditation. Sitting quietly in meditation. And Yudhishthira says, oh, Bhagavan Krishna, why are you so quiet? Why are you just sitting in meditation? Why are you so thoughtful? And Bhagavan Krishna says, Bhishma keeps flashing into my mind. I think his last days are about to be over. And I think that you need to see him. When Bhishma passes away, a wealth of information will go. Do you know that Bhishma is the son of Ganga Devi? He's been trained by Parashuram. He's been trained by Shukracharya. He's been trained by Brahaspati. He has knowledge of dharma. He has the knowledge that you need. And I'm just wondering when he dies, all of this will go away. We must go and meet him. And so Bhishma was there in the bed of arrows in Bhagavan Krishna, Yudhishthira and the Pandavas go in meet him. First Bhagavan Krishna goes and sees him. He's still in that bed of arrows. He's still taking all of the pain and Bhagavan Krishna says, you are somebody very strong. But who can lie down in the bed of arrows for so many days and take that kind of pain? And Bhishma is just so happy seeing Bhagavan Krishna, seeing his face and he just praises him. He says, I'm so happy to see you. And Bhagavan Krishna says, listen, Bhishma, your days, I know, are going, are passing quickly. And with you, so much will go. I want you to share this message of dharma, of all that you know, of what it is to rule a king, to have a kingdom. Because you have learned those lessons and you also have that experience. Because strictly speaking, uh, means Dhritarashtra might have post king, but you were ruling. And Bhishma says, but how can I tell him anything? You, Bhagavan, are there. It, it will be like a Shishya speaking in front of his guru. You, Bhagavan, know the whole code of a Kshatriya. How can I speak it all in front of you? And Bhagavan Krishna says, you do it, Bhishma. You do it. But Bhishma said, I can't even remember. My memory is clouded and I'm in so much pain. I don't know if I'll, I will do justice. And Bhagavan Krishna says, I grant you a boon that from now until your passing, you will have no pain at all. And your memory will come back and be as fresh as ever. And you will be able to give this knowledge to Yudhishthira. And Bhishma said, but why me? And Bhagavan Krishna said, because I want you, I want to give a chance to you for your glory to shine. 
and that's why I wanted to be you. And uh, Krishna calls Yudhishthira, and Yudhishthira just, you know, Bhagavan Krishna says Yudhishthira is full of guilt, full of guilt that he just doesn't know how to meet you. And so Yudhishthira was called in, and Pishma puts his hand over Yudhishthira's head and says, Please don't worry. You did not do anything. You're a Kshatriya. And that's what a Kshatriya has to do. Come tomorrow and we will start. And so in this Shanti Parva, the next day, all of them wake up early and the Pandavas, Bhagavan Krishna, they all go to Pishma. And this Shanti Parva is so extensive that if we were to study it, it will take maybe one or two years. It is so extensive because Bhishma tells him the duties of a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. He tells him how to be the ideal king. He tells him how to run a kingdom. In what city or how should the city be in where there is a kingdom? He tells him what to do with the wealth, how to safeguard against enemies. And if an enemy attacks, how to deal with that enemy, how to choose the commanders, how to choose the ministers, how to choose the advisors. Everything that one wants to know about Raja Dharma being a king is in this Shanti Parva. So anyone who's into politics, who's into government, they should read this, uh, this parva. It's excellent. He also says how old ministers should be, you know, what kind of skill they should have and wh what, what would a king need for the king to go to higher realms after this life. All of that is laid out in detail in this parva. Hmm? So Yudhishthira is acquiring this knowledge from Pishma. And this is Shanti Parva. So we've seen Stri Parva. We've seen Shanti Parva. Now we go next to what is called Anushasana Parva. Now Anushasana Parva means Anushasana Parva means Anushasana means teaching. Hmm? So Anushasana Parva is Bhishma continues this teaching to Yudhishthira. So after all of this talk of dharma, Yudhishthira asks him such beautiful questions. And I will read some verses to you because now comes the revelation of Vishnu Sasranama. So remember I told you Bhagavad uh, Mahabharata has many gems, many jewels. Remember? So we had seen Yaksha Prashna, you remember? And we had seen uh, Vidura Niti. Yeah? All of you remember all of these things? Yes? Sanat Sujatiya, yeah? we had seen. Yes? So now is another beautiful gem of this Mahabharata, which is Vishnu Sasranama. And I will read a few verses and then I will explain to you, and then you will see the beauty. Shrutva dharma na sheshena pavanani cha sarvashaha yudhishthira shantanavam punareva pyabhashita. So it says after Yudhishthira has listened to all of this talk on dharma, you know, and, and after everything, he says, I want to know something more. Can you tell me something more? Yudhishthira says, kimekam devatam loke. He says, who is that one deva in this world? Kim va api ekam parayanam. Who is that goal in this world? Stuvanto kam kamar chanta. Whom should I worship? Whom should I praise? Pratna yuhu manava shubham. Who is the one attaining which will be auspicious? And he says, Go dharma sarva dharmanam. What is the highest dharma? in this whole world. And he says, Kim Japan, whose name should I do Japa to? 
so that I can be free. Mucchate jantuhu janma samsara bandhana. To be free from this cycle of birth and death. And Pishma says, Jagat Prabhu, the Lord, Deva Devam, that Deva, that Almighty Deva, Anantam, who is infinite, Purushottamam, the ultimate Purusha. Stuvan Nama Sahasrena, when you sing his thousand names, it will be for your benefit. And so, he tells him, this is the most purifying name. This is the most wonderful name. Singing which is the high, you will reach the highest goal. Chanting which will purify your words. Thinking of which will divinize your mind. This is the name. This is the highest dharma of everything that you've listened to so far. And thus starts in Mahabharata. In this Anushasana Parva, the Vishnu Sahasranama. Huh? Vishwam Vishnur Vashatkaro Bhuta Bhavya Bhavat Prabhu Bhuta Krit Bhuta Brit Bhavo Bhutatma Bhuta Bhavana. So, very, very beautiful, beautiful part. And I, I mean, there's a thousand names, so obviously, I won't read the thousand names, but whoever's chanting Vishnu Sahasranama, now you know how it has come and how holy it is that it was given when Bhishma was on his bed of arrows to Yudhishthira. And so now what happens after this is that Bhishma now after teaching Yudhishthira everything, his time is over now. His time is over and he sees that the sun is making its way towards the north. What we say, Ma Makar Sankranti. Now we celebrate Makar Sankranti. That day he sees the sun is making its way towards the north and he knows that it's time for him to go. And so Pishma closes his eyes and he invokes the Lord after seeing Bhagavan Krishna, he invokes the Lord in his heart and Bhishma finally passes away. And it is said that when he passed away, a glow of light entered the sky and became one with the clouds and heavens, the heavens rained flowers and everyone was just so, so much in awe and in peace at this warrior who lived to tell the legend of dharma so if anybody wants to know that legend of dharma that is vishnu sasradama and the whole shanti parva is still there today with us from bhishma pitamaha hmm? now after bhishma pitamaha's passing Again, Yudhishthira has sunk in the gloom <laughs> because again, another one passes away and he says, how am I to live? You know, how, how can I go on? So what is it that makes Yudhishthira still go on despite all of this hardship? What keeps him going on the path? That we will see next. Yeah, <laughs> next year. And the, the next year will be the concluding session of the Mahabharata. You know, when I was reading this, I thought I was like, maybe I can finish all of the Parvas today. But I think, you know, it's better to just soak it in because there's so much depth and meaning to it. Hmm? So I'll just summarize what we've seen today. Then we will say a closing prayer. We've seen today Stri Parva, Shanti Parva, and Anushasana Parva. Stri Parva is when all of the bodies were laying there and all of the women, everybody had come to see all of the bodies and there was, ups, there was just lots of grief and lamentation going on about what was happening. 
And this was also the time where the Pandavas met Dhritarashtra and Gandhari. And how Bhagavan Krishna again saved Bhima by putting the metal Bhima there. And how Gandhari cursed Bhagavan Krishna that after 36 years there would be the destruction of the Vishni clan. And we also saw in this Sri Parva the revelation of Kunti that Karna was in fact the brother of the Pandavas. Then in Shanti Parva we saw how people get over grief, how they were just in deep satsang and deep around saints and sages. We saw how Narada consoles Yudhishthira and we saw how Yudhishthira, you know, he becomes finally king. He finally becomes king. And Narada had told him, as a king, you cannot have any personal grief. And it is in this Shanti Parva that Bhagavan Krishna encourages him to see Bhishma and he learns how to be a great king, which itself is a Shastra, can be another gem in Mahabharata. And then we see, or we saw Anushasana Parva, where Bhagavan Krishna and the Pandavas, they receive that final message of Bhishma, the highest dharma, which is that Vishnu Sasranama. And after giving this, Bhishma gives up his body and merges with totality. His remains are brought back. You know, his ashes, his bones, whatever remains were brought back in the river Ganga. So he once again joined his mother. Hmm? So that is what we'll see today. So we'll see the closing um, prayer. And then we have some important announcements, okay? So please stay back. Om Purnamadaf Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachati Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishati Om Shanti 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 Hari hi Om Shri Gurabhyo Namaha Hari hi Om